South Sound Seniors, a program for and about older adults in our community. First of all, before we get started, I would just like to thank the people here at Thurston County Media for allowing us to be here and to bring this show to you. They have a great staff and wonderful volunteers. And of course, I want to thank our wonderful director producer, Tom Patton, who gives up his time to help us put this show on the air. Tonight, I am really excited because oftentimes on our show, we're bringing resources or things that seniors should know about, or we're talking about things that are going on at the Senior Center. But one of the goals of the show is to bring some of the amazing and interesting people that I get to meet at the Senior Center. And I got to meet Sandy Sinclair at the Senior Center. Yeah. Welcome, Sandy. It's really nice to well, have you, you tonight. It's nice to be here. All right. Well, I did get to meet you. First of all, you came to a Storytellers Guild, the Olympia Storytellers Guild, uh -huh. and you told an amazing story about an airplane trip and crash up in the wilds of Alaska, and you kept yeah. us all on the edge of your, our seats while you told the story. And I remember going back to the Senior Center the next day and giving your name and phone number to Sarah Thiessen, our activity coordinator, and uh -huh. said, you need to have this guy come and talk to our community awareness group. Yeah. And um, that eventually it. happened. It took a few, little yeah. while, but she uh -huh. eventually got you there. Yeah. But since then, you've also started coming down to the Senior Center, so I get to see you on a semi-regular basis when you're not busy at other, doing other projects. It's nice to have someone my age to talk to, and that was good. <laughs> and you, you told me your age just before we started. You're just pushing 90 here, yeah. correct? Yeah. Well, you yeah. look like you're in great shape. So apparently some of these adventures that I hope you'll be telling me about in a minute. They may keep you young, good. but they also may have taken the whole uh, the end of the uh, line, too. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, <laughs> little, <laughs> they were that close. They were a little close shaves, <laughs> yeah. Well... After uh, you've been coming to the center, one day you brought in this amazing book that you put together with some of your exploits, mostly in Alaska mm -hmm. and such. But I have a question about the title here. It's Inside the Rainbow by Sandy Sinclair. And there's a great picture. I assume that was your wife who I didn't get to meet. Yeah. But um, you and your wife inside a circle rainbow here. So how did that title come about? Well, I have to tell you, as a teacher, we just graduated together, and we uh, uh, went to the um, uh, mail and got an invitation to teach in Alaska. And so we decided to go ahead and take it. And the name of the town, the city, the uh, the uh, island was the Sanak Island, and Sanak. we didn't find much about it uh -huh. because they they didn't have much to say. <laughs> and so we decided to take the job, but then we wondered, why can't we get more information about, the, uh, about where we're going? Uh -huh. And they said, um, um, we can't give you any information because we've never been there. <laughs> so All you're this was secondhand information. <laughs> so you're going off sight so, unseen. Don't to, uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, when we arrived at that little island, it's, it was f south of the chain, away from every, away from the rest of the So this is out on the Aleutian Alaska. chain, but yeah. quite a distance. Yeah, and so, but it was out there away from everywhere else in Alaska as well as America. And of course it was all, the only way to get there was this uh, mail boat that came once a month. Anyway, so that was our beginning. So we got there and got started and, and um, found a real interesting situation. Nobody on the island had any owned any property there? They were just squatters. Oh my gosh! Because there was a codfish industry, and they had a bunch of uh, buildings there, and they lived in those in those codfish um, buildings, and, and had their own little places in there. And there was no so there was no city um, uh, uh, there was no city uh, Government chief. Or chief or, uh -huh. There was no city police. <laughs> there was no preacher. There was nothing except these people that were living there, uh -huh. and. It's just shortly after World War II where the Aleutian War was up there, and so they had a concert hut. The, the army left there, uh -huh. and that was our school was as well hut? as our home and the end of it. Uh -huh. So that was our start. And so we ended up you know, being, uh, you know, starting the school, and it turned out we had great kids. There were the kids young. We, you know, we had all those kids in the, in the school. About how I many taught, kids? I had 20, 29 kids in the whole thing in all grades. Uh -huh. And so Marie had the first 
four grades. I had the other four grades all jammed in this little teeny part of the Quonset hut. And so, and of course there was no uh, electricity. We had three or four Coleman lanterns hanging from the ceiling. That was our lights. Oh my gosh. And, um, and there, was no, um, there was no toilet or anything like that. The, um, the, the out, there was an outhouse uh -huh. and um, we were, there was a dock that went out to the bay a little bit there uh -huh. and the outhouse was on the dock. No. So, so the tide was the flush. Oh my Lord. Oh <laughs> anyway. my goodness. But anyway, that was our start and it was pretty interesting. We got along fine and I loved the kids. They were just great because we were worried about being our first job were we going to manage. And uh -huh. we did real good with the kids and they were very cooperative. Now, were they native kids or uh, were they? They were, uh, they were half uh, Aleut and half Norwegian. Most uh -huh. of the people there were Norwegian or Swedes uh -huh. that went up there to fish and they ended up with an Aleut wife and that was uh -huh. their, uh, that was their, uh, their wow. mo uh, that's what they were, they were half, half and half. But they were good kids. So I just have to say, you married your wife, you decided to take, you went all the way out to the middle of nowhere yeah. on the Aleutian chain. That's right. And she went with you, she willingly. Was, I think it was willingly. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was true. But she was a special person, and part of this book is my tribute to her living that kind of a life with a guy like me. Uh huh. But anyway, I want to let you know the title of the book came from this. We um, started school, and the third day of school, one of the ladies came and said, I got some bad news for you. Four of your kids are now have become uh, uh, orphans and uh, just that day. Oh my and what gosh. happened was um, they um, came home from school and the door was locked, so they, they left and stayed with somebody else. The next day it was still locked, so they asked for people to help, and the people uh, sent the kids to school. And after they left, they knocked down the door with a sledgehammer and found that there was a, a murder and a suicide. Oh, no. The, uh, the dad had, had shot his wife and then committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. What do you do with that? And so um, I found that um, the, there was no law there. And so who was supposed to take care of that? Uh -huh. The school teacher. Oh, because my God. I, I was the only person that represented the territory of Alaska oh on the whole goodness. island. Whoa. And so that was my job to take care of that kind of stuff. And uh -huh. so I was totally unprepared for that kind of a thing. <laughs> you I were mean. young, you know, just out of college, the first right? Day. And so oh my the, gosh. Uh, the law was uh, Unga, 160 miles away, and they got a, on these VHF ra radios from one fishing boat to the next and finally got to them and told them what the story was. He says, I don't have the stomach for this. You have to take care of it because you're the only representative of the territory of Alaska, oh and here's gosh. what you have to do. You have to get a six-man inquest. Well, what's that? Well, that means six men go to the scene and see what they thought was happened and come and tell you. Uh -huh. And so I did that, and they all thought it was a murder and suicide, and I put that on the death certificate, and I put it in the mail. That was it. Wow. That was the whole thing about it. Uh -huh. Okay, then they used the schoolhouse, uh, uh, the, not the main school, but the, there's a shack there that we had supplies in, and they, they had to make a morgue out of that, uh -huh. and so now there's going to be a, um, a burial. Well, guess what? They asked me to be the funeral, uh, you know, and, and I wasn't really quite that kind of a... a, a yeah, I was more like a, 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 a big grown-up Tom Sawyer, and yeah. I wasn't really a, a good person to have a funeral, but I did it. And so, uh -huh. but by doing it, I ended up by being more than just a school teacher right. to these people. Oh, I and bet. so I had Marie's Bible and we went up there, up the hill, and the whole uh, community walked behind me as we took the, uh -huh. the caskets up the hill and, and they, you know, put it in there and wow. buried it. And then I, uh, I, I read the 23rd Psalm. Uh-huh. And then one of the guys started clapping and yelling. That was, uh, that was his idea of approval of what I did <laughs> at a funeral. You wouldn't expect that. But anyway, no. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was the type of thing that happened there. Well, anyway, but then I decided to make a, a, a kind of a sermon. And so my sermon was this, you know, it's not for us, I said, to judge what happened here about these people. We're, they were good friends of yours, and we're, we're not going to judge them. Let's not remember them for this moment, but for the time that they had playing with you and fishing with you and playing with their kids on the beach and that. Let's remember that. 
Uh -huh. And that was what I, I, I said, mm -hmm. and that made a terrible difference because they realized I wasn't going to judge them from right. outside. Right. I was kind of the inside person along with them. And right. so that helped a lot on me, lot. Make, making me part of them. Right. That's they it. were okay, much fine. more open to you at that point. Yeah. Than and I'll so yeah. then all the people went down the hill except the orphans uh -huh. who were there to put in the, the, uh, the dirt the on dirt. The, uh, oh. And I thought, that's not right. Let's see if I can. So I, I went over to, to do it and put my, see, take the shovel and see if let the kids go. And an alley, oh boy, came, a man came, put on my shoulder and says, no, we don't change the inherent uh, attitude and, and things that people here in the native service, uh, in the native culture uh -huh. do. So that was what their wow. idea was to do. So, so I did that happen. Anyway. How so, wow. but there was a terrible alcohol problem there. They, uh -huh. they made their own alcohol, and after the funeral, it got worse. And so, um, uh, one night, this one guy pounded on the door of the school, and I went with another emergency. So I went there and opened up the door, and he said, um, "We have a, um, a tradition here, and on the island, and that is that everybody um, trades wives once a week." And so I, I plan to go ahead and. And, and the school teacher is part of that, and so I'm going to start tonight with your wife. <laughs> well, that didn't go over too good for me. I slammed the door and, and, and shut the, uh, the thing and ended up putting a great big sign on the door. When drinking your homemade hooch, stay away from the school. That's the only law I made. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. But next a couple of days in school, this one same guy came storming into the school, opened up the door and boasted the door right into school day. Kids are there. And so I happened to have my 30 odd six right behind my desk. And I, I, I took it off the wall, and I never had better classroom attention as uh -huh. when they all watched me put a shell in the 30 odd six and say, You get out of here. He left, and that was the end of that, we thought. Everybody in the whole village knew exactly what happened, uh -huh. and they didn't talk to me about it. Nobody uh -huh. said a word to me about it, but I never had any trouble with him or anybody Nobody else knows. the rest of the year. <laughs> But it was so much trouble and so forth that we decided we've got to get away from this place for a while. And so we wanted to climb that mountain. Uh -huh. And so we decided to climb up the mountain and, and have some beauty. You can see all over the place from the uh -huh. top of the mountain. You can even see the, uh, the volcanoes up. There's a, lot, a whole steering of volcanoes on the uh, Yukon Lane. You can see it from the top of the mountain on a clear day. Uh -huh. Anyway. And so we wanted to go ahead and, and do this. So we camped out on the mountain one, one night, went up there and, and camped out and, and with, our can, with our canvas tent. And that was our, and we got up in the morning and, and it was all foggy. And we were, right, we were walking along the ridge of that mountain when all of a sudden the sun came out on a, on a spotlight on us. Well, that's really beautiful. Uh -huh. And so we thought, well, maybe you're going to have a good feeling after all. But then as we were walking along the ridge of the mountain, we looked over to our left, and there was a circle rainbow uh, with us, both Marie and I, was a shadow inside that rainbow. Oh, wow. A and uh -huh. we waved, and it waved. It was a, a regular shadow, uh -huh. and of course, what it was was a, a screen of fog, mm -hmm. and the sun then uh, crashed our, our shadow into uh -huh. that screen and made that happen, and, and that was uh, amazing. I'd never heard anything like that before. Oh, no. wow. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> that was what we saw. I and mean, it was so amazing that we, we got to tell somebody about this. But we can't tell the kids. They'll think we're crazy. So who are we going to tell? So we went down <clears throat> and talked to a, an old Aleut that lived on the island a long time. And, and I wanted to tell him the story. So I told uh -huh. him the whole story. Uh -huh. And he said, just a minute now. I have to tell you something. And that is, on this island was was ruled by a shaman, an Aleut shaman uh -huh. in the early days. And we believe his spirit is up on the mountain. Uh -huh. And we believe that even yet today, this, this, this shaman can affect people's lives who believe in him. Some of them do and some didn't about the story of, the, of, of how he had lived and he could give good luck to people and even have bad luck to people, including when they go out fishing, they wouldn't get any fish, you know, uh -huh. and the other guys w with good luck, because he had given them the, the, the symbol of good luck, uh -huh. would have good fishing. That's what he believed in. Uh -huh. He says, I think this 
experience that happened to you came from the shaman. Uh -huh. And he believes that, and I, he said he believed that putting you inside the rainbow mm -hmm. gives you eternal protection. Uh -huh. so, so that's what he told me, and we didn't know if we believed it or not, right. but it was what his story. And we, so we said, uh, thanks for the information, but then I didn't say we didn't believe it, but mm -hmm. we, neither one of us really thought much about it right. until some things started to happen that we actually survived when we shouldn't have. And they thought, oh, Marie said, you know, there might be something to what Dude, he said. Wow. So the Shanak shaman uh -huh. had made this prediction about these uh -huh. people who are, who were the, the teachers. Uh-huh. That's wow. where we got the name of this Inside the Rainbow. Wow. Well, that kind of brings us to some of the other adventures where it could have maybe gone the other way, but it didn't. It, it <laughs> went the, the fortunate way for you and for Marie. Yeah. So what, what other adventures did you have in Alaska? Well, I think I want to tell you about when we taught in Sky this, um, this Arctic Circle at Fort Yukon, and I had an airplane at that time. And so, so this we, is just to make this clear, that you left the Aleutian chain, and then this well, was the, the at a next different... Couple, uh, it wasn't the very next um, school, but we got a different school every year. Okay, so they... And that was okay. Uh-huh. It was okay with the Commissioner of Education to go ahead and have a different school because it was all right. So uh -huh. we were up inside the Arctic Circle on the Yukon River okay. at a little trapping village called Fort Yukon. Okay. And I always thought, well, I'd like to go ahead and and fly up to the Arctic Ocean with my airplane. We had skis on the airplane for wintertime skiing. So you've skiing. gotten your pilot's license. Yeah, I had my part. pilot's license. Okay. And so that made it part of the thing you do in Alaska. Everybody, not everybody, there's lots of pilots in Alaska. Uh -huh. I wasn't alone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so we decided on, uh, in, in about March, which uh -huh. is still winter time up there, right. to fly into Canada and then fly up uh, if we could, to the Arctic Ocean, if we could, just to see that. Well, uh, I had a magnetic compass on the, on the airplane. Uh -huh. Well, I knew that as soon as you get close to the magnetic North Pole, it's probably, it probably wasn't going to work, but I didn't realize it was going to happen so soon. Uh -huh. As soon as we left uh, Fort Yukon, we checked in with the Canadian Mounted Police there at, at Old Crow, and, it was, and then we started. Uh, he was an interesting person, but he had been in, all by himself all winter, mm -hmm. except talking with the natives, and he wanted to have somebody to talk to, and so here's my wife, and, and so we had a chance to talk with somebody of his own intellect, and he kind of talked too long, uh -huh. because then when we finally left and headed, headed out, it was getting towards dark, uh -oh. and he talked, uh, we allowed him to talk too much for us, <laughs> and so we lost the, uh, the chance of flying in the daylight. And so I was flying on this river called Porcupine River, and pretty soon my compass wasn't working. And I, I, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't expect it to happen that quick. I thought I'd be able to get into the Mackenzie River area, and then it happened, but it didn't. And so here we were kind of lost, so to speak. And it's getting before, dark. And, and then it got dark, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I, I have to tell you that <clears throat> there, was a, there was a real you know, army-type um, instructor that, we, that taught us how to fly at my national, my, uh, my commercial license. He was the, the instructor and he, he was a real hard nosed and I just hated him because the way he talked. But at that time I would try to remember all the things he told me because he, his information is gonna be able to help me. So I had to realize that this tough, hard nosed teacher uh -huh. was a good teacher in the long run. So anyway, I tried to remember what he tell, told me and he told me some things that I had to go ahead and realize. He says, use your judgment here get out of the cockpit. That's what he said. And so I remember, you can't just spend your time looking at the, your instruments. Uh, you gotta go ahead okay. and get in a larger sense. Well, anyway, so the dark, and so then here we were in the Arctic and the sun went down. But I knew the sun went down in the west and it was just a real red glow there, that's all it was. And I was flying there and I knew if I flew away from the sun, I'd be going east. Okay. That's the only way I you know, couldn't use the compass. I had to use that judgment uh -huh. to be able to get into the Mackenzie River area. And so I flew directly away from what behind that red line, that red glow, uh -huh. and that gave me an easterly uh, um, course. And ended up, I did see a, um, a little light after about an hour of that, and that gave me an idea there's other people around here, and I realized we're going to get to the Mackenzie River, and then we turned left, and that we got to Aklavik, the only place in the whole area there uh, that had any human 
safety and, uh -huh. and good things. So that's how I made it. That was a miracle. It was. Yeah, wow. But I had to... Uh, so w while you were lost, did your wife know that you were lost? Well, she was the navigator. Oh. <laughs> I made her the navigator because she could... She, but we, what we navigated was just by checkpoints. Uh -huh. And I could put some checkpoints in there, but pretty soon we ran out of checkpoints. In the dark. And the, yeah. So, yeah, she, it was no question about it. Uh -huh. She didn't panic. She just kind of had... And, and uh, I can't say well, she trusted me, but yeah. she's, <laughs> she might have... <laughs> be able to hope that we would use good judgment and get it there. And he did. But she knew what I was doing about the the red light behind me, the uh, sun. So she so understood what miracle. I was doing. Yeah. But the rest of the story was what was going on with Marie. Well, if I want to tell you that I would never have taken this trip if I knew known it would be that uh, dangerous for us. But Marie, at the time we did this, was six months pregnant oh, with gosh. our first child. So <laughs> oh, wow. That was really a hard-nosed thing to do. Yeah. And I would never have done it if I thought we were going to put her in trouble. But that's what happened. And so we had to go ahead and survive. Well, you were inside the rainbow. Yeah. And I think that was But I have to tell you, that is when we kind of started believing the, sh the, the shaman story. Yeah, I <laughs> bet. I bet. That is just amazing. Yeah. Well, Sandy, we're going to take a little break here. Okay for a minute and we're going to come back and okay. it'll probably be the next time our show is on but I don't want you to run away because I know you've got some more stories okay. okay so please stay with me okay and I hope you are enjoying Sandy Sinclair as much as I did at the Storytellers Guild and that we enjoy him down at the Olympia Senior Center and please Stick around, we're going to hear some from trips and tours and some more information for you. And be sure to stay tuned next month when you will get to hear from Sandy Sinclair again. Okay.